Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Paul Offit. Um, so Dr. Offit is the director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as the Maurice R. Hillman Professor of Vaccinology and a professor of pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Offit has published more than 160 peer-reviewed papers and medical and scientific journals in the areas of rotavirus-specific immune responses and vaccine safety. He's also the co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech, um, recommended for universal use in infants by the CDC in 2006 and by the WHO in 2013. Dr. Offit has won numerous institutional, local, and national awards, including the Luigi Mastroioni and William Osler Awards from the University of Pennsylvania, the Franklin Founder Award from uh, the City of Philadelphia, and the President's Certificate for Outstanding Service from the American Academy of Pediatrics. In 2011, he was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. And in 2018, he received the gold medal from the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Dr. Offit was a member of the Adv Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to the CDC, is currently a member of the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee, and is a founding advisory board member of the Autism Science Foundation and the Foundation for Vaccine Research. He's also the author of uh, nine award-winning uh, medical narratives, including his most recent work entitled You Bet Your Life, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccinations, The Long and Risky History of Medical Innovations. Um, we're really grateful for his time today. So without further ado, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Let me screen share here. Okay. So um, what I thought I would talk about was everything that we all of us want to talk about, which is trying to stop this pandemic. Um, it, it is interesting that over the last few weeks, things have gotten better. I mean, if you look at the number of daily new cases, they have gone down. That has also been true of hospitalizations caused by COVID-19 and deaths caused by this virus. So, so why is that? I think the principal reason actually is the weather. Um, this virus is basically a winter respiratory virus. So, so it doesn't spread or shouldn't spread as easily over the summer. And I think you see that if you look at the deaths, which are probably the more, most reliable of the statistics. If you, the virus came into this country or at least started to kill people in this country in the first week of March. And then you see sort of it, it takes off and you get to as many as 2,500 deaths a day. And then as the, the, the summer comes, it starts to come down. And you see there are many days in which there are fewer than 600 deaths. But then as the, the winter comes, it takes off again and has, has you know, at its peak as many as, as more than 4,000 deaths a day. I, I wonder if the virus had come in here last October and started to kill people, that what we're seeing this winter could have been superimposed on what we saw last winter. Now, it's not, I mean, it's not absolute. Certainly this virus was transmitted during this summer and it raged in, in even, uh, you know, humid climates like Florida or Texas or Southern California. But um, but I think it is basically a winter virus. And, and so I think that's that's at least one reason that these cases have come down. I think the other is is the, the population immunity. Um, one is that induced by disease. If you look here, and this is from, uh, I think this may be from today, but there are about uh, 30 million people are said to have been infected. But those are just the people who've been tested and found to be infected. Um, many people who have either asymptomatic infection or mild disease never get tested. So the only way to really know how many people in this country have really been in infected um, is to do antibody surveillance studies. When those studies are done, this number of 30 million is probably off by a factor of three. It's probably more likely that between 85 and 100 million people in this country have already been exposed to this virus and then are likely immune, at least immune to moderate to severe disease. That's 20, at least 25%. The other is the immunity induced by vaccination. So as, to today, as of today, about 113 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered. About 34 of every 100 people in the US have received at least one dose of vaccine. About 40 million people have been fully vaccinated with the mRNA vaccines, which is about 12% of the population. If you combine the immunity induced by disease with that induced by immunization, even the sort of the partial immunity that's induced by a single dose of mRNA vaccine, 
um, you have probably at least about 35% of the US population that's protected, which may be enough to also start to see a decline in the spread of this virus. So I think over the next few months, there are two things working against this virus. One is the, the, the weather, and the other is the fact that we're continuing to vaccinate. Now we're up to about two and a half million doses of vaccine being administered a day. So let's talk for a second about the, the vaccines. Um, to understand the vaccines, you need to understand the virus. This is a, a single-stranded RNA virus, is SARS-CoV-2. It's about the size of hepatitis A virus. It has uh, four uh, um, uh, proteins, structural and non-structural proteins. The, the key protein is that spike protein that emanates from the surface of the virus. That is the protein responsible for attaching the virus to cells. Therefore, if you can make an antibody response directed against that protein, you can prevent the virus from attaching to cells or entering cells or set another way, prevent the virus from infecting you. Um, this is just a higher power magnification. You can see it's that spike protein that gives the, uh, the virus its crown-like appearance, hence corona. And then on the right-hand side, you see the, the sort of the key, the business end of this, this molecule, um, both the receptor binding domain and the uh, and terminal domain, which are key. And as we get to the variants, uh, understanding that, that those are the key regions becomes important. That's the virus binding region. Okay, so the initial strategies were a strategy that has never been used to make a commercial vaccine before, which is that of messenger RNA. So how do messenger RNA vaccines work? So, so messenger RNA, um, these vaccines that are developed by Pfizer and Moderna um, are, um, are code for the coronavirus spike protein, the pre-fusion uh, version, stabilized pre-fusion version of the coronavirus spike protein, because we all have RNA ACEs in our body, um, you can't just inoculate somebody with messenger RNA alone, it would be broken down in minutes. So rather it is encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle, which when then injected into the, into the arm um, is taken up by a variety of cells, but the most important of which are dendritic cells. And then that, uh, that lipid nanoparticle is dissolved away, the mRNA enters the ribosomal system and then is, is uh, translated either to a whole protein, but actually more importantly, it's actually fragmented to sort of 10 to 15 peptides that are then put on the surface of that den dendritic cell. The dendritic cell then travels to the local lymph node, which is why uh, ipsilateral lymphadenopathy is a, a fairly uh, common feature of, of following this immunization, where it then stimulates uh, B cells to make antibodies, stimulates T helper cells to help B cells make antibodies, stimulates cytotoxic T cells, which can kill virus infected cells. Um, and that's the way this works. So let's start with the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine is given as a two dose vaccine separated by 21 days apart. Each dose is 30 micrograms. It comes in, in a five dose multi-dose file. Um, it has um, challenging shipping and handling characteristics, at least uh, in the first round of this vaccine, where it has to be shipped and stored between minus 60 and minus, eight, minus to 80 degrees centigrade. Um, it has once thawed, it has a five day life in the refrigerator, which is not very long. And um, it's, it's one other point is that it, it, once it's, you enter the, uh, the rubber stopper with a, a needle, you only have six hours to give the vaccine. That's actually true for all three vaccines that are currently used in this country. Um, the reason is, is that this is probably the only example of a multi-dose vial for a vaccine that doesn't contain a preservative. Because it doesn't contain a preservative, um, you can inadvertently inoculate uh, bacteria into that vial, which then can, can be a problem as you move to the, say, third, fourth, or fifth dose. So that, that's why the six hour rule. Okay, the, uh, when these, um, these, these studies were put together, the, and the National Institutes of Health uh, formed a group called the ACTIVE group, which uh, just stands for Accelerating COVID uh, Technological Innovations and Vaccines. And um, by Francis Collins, I was actually part of that group. And, and we, we tr tried mightily to make sure that when we did these studies, that this, this looked like America, that the, the population of people who were recruited for these studies looked like the American public. So then when we went to the American public to say, look, uh, here are these vaccines, we could at least comfortably say, you, your group has been tested. 
So um, we wanted to make sure that there was an adequate representation, representation of black or, the Black or African American community, the Hispanic or Latinx community, as well as people who are over uh, 65 years of age. And as you can see on the right-hand portion of those slides, those, those uh, percentages fairly closely mimic uh, what is seen in the American public. This is also true for people, as you can see, who are over, uh, over 65 years of age, who are obviously a particular target for this, uh, for this virus. Okay, in terms of safety, it's sort of in terms of the more mild uh, phenomena, it's sort of not surprising you can have pain or uh, redness or swelling or tenderness at the site of injection. And I think more uh, worrisomely is that this is not, this is not an easy vaccine. I mean, it, it's uh, with that second dose, especially in people younger than, than say 65 years of age, you can have pretty significant side effects that include uh, fever, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle pain, joint pain. I mean, so much so that when we inoculated our emergency department um, staff, we staggered those inoculations. We didn't give them all at one time because we feared that people may choose to take uh, a day or two off work because of the, the symptoms were pretty significant. And, and they were, I, I got uh, uh, two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. And with that second dose, I definitely had two days of fatigue uh, fever, including actually fairly high fever and, uh, and chills. So, which I, by the way, successfully treated with constant whining. And after two days, it was gone. So you can consider that. And this is usually the story. It usually lasts for a couple days and then goes away. Okay, in terms of efficacy, this is just a Kaplan-Meier graph showing the separation in terms of uh, cumulative incidence of disease in a vaccinated versus placebo group. And if you look at the right-hand portion of this slide, you can see that um, the vaccine, that there were 162 cases of mild, moderate, or severe disease in the placebo group, only eight in the vaccine group for a protective efficacy of around 95%. Similarly, that efficacy of around 95% was seen for, for all ages, for obviously for both genders, for um, for uh, for all ethnic and ra racial uh, groups, um, pretty, pretty consistent across the board. And it was also true for a variety of comorbidities, including chronic lung or chronic um, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, et cetera. It was a consistent, protect, it had a consistent protective effect. And against severe disease, although the numbers were low, there were only five cases of severe disease in the placebo group, none in the vaccine group, but again, highly protective against severe disease. It's everything you could have asked for. Um, let's go back a slide. And, and in terms of safety, um, you know, we knew, um, the, the, we knew the safety in tens of thousands of people. There was no serious adverse event that was seen, at least in these, this particular trial, this trial of, you know, roughly uh, uh, 40,000 people or so. Um, but um, you never really know whether or not there's a serious adverse event until the vaccine is in several million people. The uh, Maurice Hillman, who I consider to be the father of modern vaccines, said it best. He said, quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. That remains true. And now not only the first three million doses out there, the first hundred million doses are out there. So I think we can be um, amazed actually by this vaccine. I, I mean, and I'll get to the Moderna data in a second, but um, if you think about it, it's, it's, uh, it's just remarkable. If you would ask a thousand scientists in January of 2020, when the uh, sequence of this virus was published in the journal Science, whether you thought that within a year we would have, you know, two trials that were um, you know, at least 30,000 people that showed, you know, 95% efficacy using a strategy, messenger RNA, for, with which we had no commercial experience previously, and that the vaccine was safe, even in terms of uh, after it was given to tens of millions of people. I don't think there's a scientist on this planet that would have thought that was possible, but that's what's happened. I, I mean, think back to, to uh, uh, say, uh, May, June of last year, when Dr. Fauci and others said, you know, we would be happy if they, we had 50% protection, given, you know, that that still offers something that pandemic, and we would be ecstatic at 70% protection. Well, we have virtually 95% protection with this vaccine. 
And, and Moderna also uh, did a, a similarly sized trial, which sort of independently uh, confirmed the amazing results that were seen with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, here, the, this, the, uh, the shipping and storage characteristics aren't quite as onerous and they can be shipped and stored uh, uh, frozen. Um, again, has a refrigerator life here instead of five days, a refrigerator life of 30 days. Pfizer, by the way, is going to be modifying its product to make it a little more uh, user friendly. Here, again, it's a multi dose file with 10 doses. And again, once uh, that rubber stopper is, stopper is violated, you have six hours to give that vaccine. Um, again, the demographics of the, the uh, participants mimicked um, that that is seen in this country so that these, these vaccine trials could look like America, uh, not only in terms of racial and ethnic background, but also in terms of uh, age and in terms of a variety of other comorbidities. In terms of safety, it's almost identical to what was seen with the Pfizer trial. Um, you see that you know pain, uh, redness, tenderness is is uh, a feature of getting a shot. And again, you know you had um, a fairly high incidence of, of fatigue, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, chills, nausea, vomiting, etc. I think I think what's important here is to make sure that people know this that before they get the vaccine, that this is something that they might experience. Um, you know, it's carried in the story is often carried in the media as, as a bad thing, you know, that, that you're having these symptoms, but this is just your immune response being activated. Um, you know, when you when your immune response is activated, you make a series of cytokines and chemokines, which can have this effect on your body. It just means that you're responding to uh, a, in this case, a foreign protein. And that's a good thing. I, I think that it would be nice actually for the immune system to get a public, better public relations team than the one that they currently have. I think they should actually hire the public relations team that is currently being employed by mother nature because you know, somehow the word natural has great cachet for reasons that still elude me. Um, mother nature has been pretty much trying to kill us ever since we crawled out of the ocean onto land, but um, in any case. In terms of efficacy, again, this is a Kaplan-Meier uh, graph showing the clear separation uh, between uh, vaccine and placebo. I, I want to point out one other thing here. The, the, there were people who between dose one and dose two became ill. And, and so you could see actually the protective effect of a single dose. This was also true in the Moderna trial. Here you had a four week uh, period of time between the first and second dose with the, Moderna, with the Pfizer trial it was a three week period. And, and there was recently a letter, which I wish frankly had never been published. That was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by two Canadian researchers that sort of further analyzed those data between the first and second dose and concluded that if you just looked at sort of between, between uh, in that second, second to third week for the Pfizer vaccine and the second to fourth week for the Moderna vaccine, that you could argue that the vaccine was 75 to 90% effective, which has been carried by a number of people on national television as saying that one dose works and that therefore we should get as many people for the first dose as possible um, as we can. I think that was a mistake for a lot of reasons. Uh, right now, the good news is only about 3.4% of people who got the first dose haven't gotten the second dose yet, so, so that's good. But I do think that we could have created the misperception that one dose is good enough and it's not. If you look at the, the, the cellular immune responses that are created after that first dose, they're not detectable. After the second dose, they clearly are, which presages durable immunity. I mean, I do think it is possible that, that this, these vaccines, these mRNA vaccines uh, could be effective for years. But I, I think that, and this is work that's been done by Shane Crotty at, at UCAL San Diego and others, that, that, if, you, uh, that, that, that um, if you don't get that second dose, I think you're gonna have much less durable immunity. Uh, so I think that that was a bad messaging story because I, I think many people, it's hard enough to get people to get vaccinated anyway, but uh, to get them back for a second dose is, is, is even more difficult. And uh, the notion that one dose may have been good enough, especially because people will fear the side effects associated with the second dose. It's unfortunate that letter was published. I think it's unfortunate that a number of, of uh, pundits on the media have, uh, have, have tried to push for as much single dose as possible. Um, I think people need to, to make it clear, and Dr. Fauci has been great about this. This is a two-dose vaccine.
Okay, again, the, the data were, were remarkable. If you look at the right-hand portion of the slide, there was uh, 185 cases of disease, and that is mild, moderate, or severe disease in the placebo group, only 11 in the vaccine group. So again, about 94% effective at prevention of, of all manner of illness, mild, moderate, moderate, or severe disease, which is amazing. This is just a forest plot showing that that level of protection extended to people uh, who were older, as well as those with a variety of comorbidities, as well as all racial and ethnic groups. Here, there were more cases of severe disease. You can see there are uh, 30 cases in the placebo group, none in the vaccine group. I'm sorry, none in the yeah, none in the vaccine group. You know, for a protective efficacy of 100% against severe disease, meaning this is the kind of vaccine that is going to keep you really from seeking medical attention, from going to the the hospital, from going to the ICU, or from going to the morgue. Um, one question that I get asked the most, I would say, about these messenger RNA vaccines is, is can it alter our DNA? And, and, and this is, I think these messenger RNA vaccines represent sort of that next era of vaccinology, which is the genetics era. I mean, if, for example, previously, if you wanted to try and induce an immune response against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, you would give either the protein alone, uh, you know, as generated from a yeast or baculovirus expression system, um, which is the way we make the human papillomavirus vaccine or the hepatitis B vaccine. So you give that protein and then you induce an immune response to that protein, or you give a, a whole inactivated form of the virus, which is what uh, Chinese researchers have done. And, and that's a vaccine that's being used in China, which is another way to give the protein, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. That's the way we make the inactivated polio vaccine or the hepatitis A vaccine or the rabies vaccine, or you give a live attenuated form of the virus. Um, I don't know any group that's currently working on that for this virus, but you know, that, which is the way that we make the measles vaccine or the mumps vaccine or the rubella vaccine or the varicella vaccine or one of the rotavirus vaccines. In all those cases, you're giving the protein. Here you're not, you're giving the gene that codes for the protein. So therefore your body makes the, the, the protein and then your body makes antibody, an antibody response to that protein. So the mere notion of the word genetics scares people. It does. It makes them think that you're giving something that's going to alter their DNA. That is not possible with this technology, and I'll explain why. Once the messenger RNA is taken up into the cytoplasm with another couple hundred thousand other pieces of messenger RNA, which are there making the proteins and enzymes that our cells need to keep us alive, um, it, 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 in order for it to enter the nucleus where DNA resides, it has to get across the nuclear membrane, which requires a nuclear access signal that this molecule doesn't have. Even if it were to get into the nucleus, which it can't, it's RNA, it's not DNA it would have to be reverse transcribed back to DNA, which requires the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which it doesn't have. So um, therefore it, it, it can't be reverse transcribed. Third, even if it was, if it did enter the nucleus, which it can't, or it was reverse, reverse transcribed, which it's not, it still has to be integrated into the DNA, which requires an integrase enzyme, which it also doesn't have. So it's not possible. It's not just that the chances are small. The chances are zero. Honestly, you have a greater chance of getting this vaccine and becoming Spider-Man than you have of it in any sense altering your DNA. Although just because I think it's important never to leave the science, you become Spider-Man when you're bitten by a radioactive spider. Okay, so now there's a third vaccine which is being used in this country um, that uh, doesn't include the mRNA strategy, rather it's the replication defective viral vector strategy, and that is um, used by uh, Janssen, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. So the way this works is you take a, a, an adenovirus type 26, which is a human adenovirus that is rare. Most people don't have antibodies directed against ad 26. You then alter the genome of this adenovirus by removing the E1 gene and the E3 gene. The E1 gene is, is critical for virus replication. Once you've removed that gene, that virus cannot reproduce itself. At the same time, you take the area where the E1 gene was, you insert that, that transgene. In this case, it's the gene that codes for the coronavirus spike protein. Um, and that's the way this is made. So, so um, the, on the bright side, the virus cannot reproduce itself. Um, therefore, it cannot cause any disease that would mimic a disease caused by adenovirus. 
On the other side of that, because it can't reproduce itself, you give a lot of virus. You give roughly 50 billion virus particles. And, and when you, you're going to see the side effect profile, the reason it has, again, a fairly difficult side effect profile is because that's a lot of virus. The other, the other point to make, by the way, is you know, because you, need, you de do need to grow this virus up in, in the, uh, in, if you're going to mass produce it. Um, in order to do that, you have to have cells in this case, the cell line that's used is called per C6 cells. You have to have cells that provide that E1 gene. And the cell line that's used is, is the so-called per C6 cells is a cell line that was derived initially in the mid 1980s from a, an abortion um, and it was an 18 week old fetus and specifically retinal cells from that fetus. So, so that's the other thing that you're starting to hear is are people who, um, who are uh, uncomfortable with the fact that a, a, an, a cell line that was made from an 18 week old fetus is used actually to grow this virus up. And, and, and it's true. I mean, if you, if you probably analyze the, that vaccine, you would find picogram levels of DNA from that per C6 cell line. This is also true actually for the UK AstraZeneca vaccine, which we don't have in this country. Uh, that va virus uh, is also replication defective. It also has grown up in, in uh, cells that were obtained from a fetus. In that case, it was uh, human embryonic kidney cells from a fetus in 1972 called HEK293 cells. So this, this is not an issue that is going to die. I think that as a general rule, the Catholic Church has been good about this. What they've said is they would prefer you not get these vaccines, but get what you can. And if, if you're, if you're going to be, don't delay getting a vaccine because you're waiting, say, for an mRNA vaccine because you don't want this vaccine. So I think that's, that's a responsible position. So here, the way this works is that the, um, the virus uh, enters the cell. Ultimately, it does enter the, the nucleus where then that, that this is a, uh, a DNA vaccine. That DNA, uh, that, that, that transgene then is, trans, uh, uh, is transcribed to messenger RNA, which then enters the cytoplasm, which then puts you in the same final pathway as those mRNA vaccines. Um, this is, is not a, uh, an integrating virus. The FDA has classified this as a non-integrating virus. Um, it cannot possibly alter your DNA because it can't integrate into DNA because it doesn't contain the, uh, the integrase. Okay, th this, um, this vaccine is, can be shipped and stored at refrigerator's temperature, which is much easier. It has a, a, a fairly long refrigerator life. It too, however, is a multi-dose file that once the, the stopper is violated, um, gives you only six hours. You know, to be, to be uh, um, I, I'd like to believe that the reason that, that a, a preservative like thimerosal or like 2-phenoxyethanol was not included in these vaccines was because it interfered with either, let's say, the lipid nanoparticle of the mRNA vaccines or somehow was deleterious to the uh, to this virus, but I, I, I'm not sure that's true. I think, I think the real reason for why these don't these vaccines don't contain preservatives is so that the companies could state that they're preservative free, and not that those preservatives are in any way harmful because they're not. They've consistently been shown not to be harmful, and I, I, I hope what didn't happen here was that this was a nod to basically the anti-vaccine community who have been decrying preservatives and vaccines for. A couple decades. I mean, I, I hope that's not the reason why, because if it's true, that's a problem. Because as we know, when you have that six hour restriction, sometimes vaccine gets thrown out once you exceed that six hour life, which is uh, tragic. Okay, regarding demographics of, of these um, vaccines, again, it looks like America in terms of racial and ethnic backgrounds and in terms of age. And in terms of safety, you really pretty much see the same sort of safety profile regarding both local reactions and the more significant uh, reactions of uh, headache, fatigue, myalgia, nausea, fever. I'm going to put up immunogenicity here just to make this one point because I didn't show that with the other vaccines, is that you can, with these vaccines, um, see um, an, an excellent a neutralizing antibody response after just one dose. Um, that, that, that mimics really the immune response that is seen following natural infection, both in younger and older participants. And, and more importantly, as distinct from the mRNA vaccines, after a single dose, you get a vigorous both CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cell response. And the T cell response for the CD4 positive cells is primarily Th1, not the more worrisome Th2, which is more sort of an allergic bias response and makes one worry about antibody-dependent enhancement, which is not a problem with this vaccine. 
opinion. So um, I just wanted to, to make the point that, 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 that this also presages uh, more durable immunity. Now that said, if you look at the, the non-human primate studies that were done with this vaccine, there was a two and a half to threefold increase in neutralizing antibodies with, with a second dose. Similarly, if you look at the phase one, phase two A data with this vaccine, there was a, a, an increase in, again, about two and a half fold of neutralizing antibodies with that second dose. So currently Johnson & Johnson is doing a two dose trials in the United States to see whether or not those increases in neutralizing antibodies after that second dose also corresponds to uh, a, a, an increased uh, clinical response. Um, so we'll see. It, it may be that later on in this year that we find that that second dose is, is better, in which case one can get a second dose. But that's going on in terms of efficacy. This again is the Kaplan-Meyer um, graph showing um, the difference between the vaccinated versus unvaccinated group. Um, the data aren't quite as <clears throat> dramatic for mild, moderate to severe disease with this vaccine as compared to with the mRNA vaccines. It, this is the US portion of a trial that was done both in the US as well as Brazil, as well as a number of South uh, American countries, as well as, uh, as South Africa. But this is the US portion of that trial, which was a um, for, for uh, this vaccine, about a 44,000 person trial in all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, efficacy against severe disease. Again, if you look here, um, it's uh, 34 cases in the placebo group, five in the vaccine group. So it's higher against severe disease, severe critical disease, the kind of disease that would cause you to seek medical attention, about 85%. And then if you look at protection against hospitalization, it's excellent. Um, ranging after 28 days of, of you know 16 cases in the placebo group, none in the vaccine group. And that was also true with death of the sort of five deaths that were confirmed as being caused by COVID. They were all in the placebo group and interestingly all in South Africa. Okay, how about safety uh, now that this vaccine in the US has been approved through emergency use authorization? And I should point out one thing here because this comes up also. You know, people are concerned by the fact that this vaccine was developed in a year. That is certainly the fastest vaccine ever made. I think the previous record holder was Maurice Hilleman with the mumps vaccine, which he isolated that virus from his daughter in 1963, and that became a vaccine in 1967. That was a four year from uh, isolating the virus to having a vaccine. This was in one year. Um, I, so I think that makes people nervous. I think the language around this vaccine, like with phrases like Operation Warp Speed or the race for a vaccine or who's gonna be the first to cross the finish line scares people. And finally, I think it does scare people th th a little bit that this is not a licensed product. I mean, none of these products are licensed products. These companies didn't submit a biologics license application. They just submitted for approval under emergency use authorization, which basically is the equivalent of a permission to use an investigation on new drugs. That's what an EUA approval is. And you saw that with hydroxychloroquine. I mean, the, the administration actually was able to arm twist uh, the FDA to approve hydroxychloroquine absent any evidence, any clear evidence that it either treated or prevented this disease. And a, a few months after that approval, they removed that approval when it was shown redundantly that it did neither, that it didn't prevent or treat that disease. And all that scared people, under, understandably. But I would say this. First of all, the size of these trials is typical for any vaccine trial, pediatric or adult, 30,000 for Moderna, 44,000 for uh, Pfizer and Janssen. That, that's the size of any pediatric trial. I mean, you know, the, the HPV trial was a 30,000 person trial. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccines was a 35,000 person trial. So it's not, the, it's not the size of the trial. Similarly, it's really not the length of time of safety follow-up. Typically you want two months of safety follow-up after the last dose because any serious adverse event that's occurred um, following a, a vaccine has occurred within six weeks of a dose. I mean, take your pick, whether it's, it's um, say, uh, polio following the oral polio vaccine or, or viscerotropic disease following yellow fever vaccine or Guillain-Barre syndrome following uh, influenza vaccine, all of which are incredibly rare, or narcolepsy following the squalene ad adjuvanted flu vaccine in Europe, all occur within six weeks of a dose. All are incredibly rare, but become obvious early on. Um, the real reason that this wasn't um, approved through a license application was length of follow-up for, for efficacy. That was really the main reason. I mean, you could say that the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the, and the Janssen vaccine were effective for a few months. That's what you could say. You couldn't say it was effective for a year or two years or three years, although I think, frankly, with this, the uh, cellular immune responses that you're seeing, I think you can say that it's going to be effective for certainly at least a year, but likely years. Um, that was the reason. My understanding from Janet Woodcock at the FDA is that these companies may be coming back in the summer to get a, get a biologics license application. 
Okay, so how about safety post approval? So the 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 um, the system that we have in this country that really enables to look at that in a, in a thoughtful way is the so-called vaccine safety data link. This consists of about 12 million people that are monitored through nine participating integrated healthcare organizations. So it's a link computerized medical record system. You can very quickly see who's gotten a vaccine and who hasn't. Um, the, the number of doses that were followed are shown here for the Pfizer Moderna uh, vaccine. These were data that were presented uh, both to the CDC and the FDA in the last couple of weeks. Um, by Tom uh, Shumbakura in the vaccine safety group at the CDC. So regarding anaphylaxis, um, which is an immediate hypersensitivity reaction that occurs typically within 15 minutes of a dose, uh, the rate was about 4.7 cases per million for the Pfizer vaccine, 2.5 per million for the Moderna vaccine. Those numbers have been coming down as more and more people are vaccinated. So we'll see the background rate really for any vaccine in terms of anaphylaxis is about one case per million. So this is a little more than that um, now. Regarding Bell's palsy, this was actually worrisome, actually, when these data were first presented to us at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee on December 10th and December 17th. In the Pfizer phase three trials, there were four cases of Bell's palsy that were observed in the vaccine group, uh, none in the placebo group. In the Moderna phase three trial, there were three cases of Bell's palsy in the vaccine group and one in the placebo group. If you take those together, Bell's palsy then occurred in eight cases per 10,000 per year in the vaccine group and 1.2 cases per 10,000 per year in the placebo group, which was statistically significant. That 1.2 cases per 10,000 per year is the background rate of Bell's palsy. So this was worrisome. Um, but again, the, the, it's always the problem or the tyranny of small numbers taken from a large database. You, you really do need to look at larger numbers of cases to see whether or not that, that holds up, which is basically what was done. Um, if you look at Bell's palsy, which is one of six down from the top, there was no difference in, in the instance of Bell's palsy in a vaccinated versus unvaccinated group. And there was no difference in Bell's palsy appearing within 21 days or later than 21 days, again, in, in a vaccinated group. So um, I think we can feel better about this. Also, if you look, because this is going to come up at two from the bottom where it says venous thromboembolism, there also was no evidence for, for either of the two mRNA vaccines that uh, the thromboembolism occurred more frequently in a vaccinated group or that it occurred more frequently within 21 days or after 21 days in a, in a vaccinated group. So again, no difference between vaccinated versus unvaccinated for thromboembolism. This has come up now, and you may want to ask questions about this later, with the AstraZeneca UK vaccine in Europe. Okay. Regarding pregnancy, um, in, in both of the trials, both the Moderna and the, um, the Pfizer trial, they excluded women who were pregnant from entering the study, but, you know, but life finds a way. And so there were women who got pregnant during those studies, about 23 during the Pfizer trial, about 13 during the Moderna trial. They equally were split among vaccine and placebo group. There were two cases of spontaneous abortion in those trials, uh, both of which occurred in the placebo group. So, but, but in any case, the, uh, uh, typically when, when you don't have studies in pregnant women, and we did have studies in pregnant women, the CDC usually says, okay, uh, contraindicated in pregnant women, we don't have data. They didn't do that here. They said that a, a woman could reasonably while pregnant choose to get this vaccine because um, certainly women who are pregnant when they're infected with SARS-CoV-2 are more likely to develop um, severe disease than, than women of the same age who aren't pregnant. And so, so what's, what the CDC has done basically is they have something called the V-SAFE system, which is this sort of text message check-in on a weekly basis uh, so that when a, someone has been uh, vaccinated who is pregnant, they can then be, they can follow them throughout the pregnancy to, to make sure that the mom is okay. And then they're gonna be following the uh, pregnant, the, the child uh, up to six months post, uh, post delivery. Um, looking for for the, the the such things such as fetal demise, pregnancy complications, maternal intensive care unit admission, adverse birth outcomes, neonatal death, infant hospitalizations, and major birth defects. Um, today, this is about a week and a half old, so it's uh, it's not. No, I'm sorry, it's longer than this, about a month old. Um, about as of a month ago, about thirty thousand pregnant women had been vaccinated, many of whom are being followed by these. Uh, the, all of them are really being followed by the V Safe system. Okay, so what about kids? Um, this is, is SARS-CoV-2 is uh, has a preference for older people. 92% uh, of the deaths occur in people over 55 years of age. 
Uh, people less than, than uh, 18 years of age make up about 20% of the US population, but only 0.08% of the deaths. I mean, nonetheless, the, the number of children who died last year, meaning children less than 18 years of age from COVID-19 was 174 as of last count, which is about the same number as die of influenza every year in this country, um, a, a virus for which we also have a vaccine for children. Um, and every year about 150, as I said, though, so, so and, and so and we also know that about 100 children died every year from varicella, 500 from measles. It's not so, uh, so, uh, so far off to recommend a vaccine for, for this, this, uh, this virus, given that it can also kill children and children can also suffer, as you know, well, this unusual multi-system inflammatory disease called NIST-C. Um, and the, the, this slide just shows the number of, uh, of MIS-C cases and deaths associated with, with MIS-C. So, so if a virus can harm children and if it can cause children to suffer or be hospitalized or die and you can safely prevent it, then we should prevent it. So where things stand is the, bio, the, bio, the Pfizer vaccine included uh, 280, uh, 283 children between 16 to 17 years of age that were in that phase three study. None had COVID-19. The Pfizer has now completed enrollment of 12 to 15 year olds in a separate study. Moderna has also completed enrollment of 12 to 17 years old. These trials are gonna be immunobridging studies, not efficacy studies because children just don't get sick that often that would allow you to do a, 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 an efficacy study the sizes of the ones that have been done. You'd have to do a much bigger study. And so these studies are gonna be involve uh, several thousand children. In terms of what's going forward, uh, Janssen is doing a 3000 child study from birth to 18 years, 18 years of age and Moderna, a 6,700 child study from six months to less than 12 years of age. And those are already um, certainly in, in, the, in the planning stages. Okay, so I think there, there are just two more things I wanna say. Uh, I think there are two major challenges to stopping the COVID-19 pandemic. I actually think that the second challenge that I'm gonna present is, is bigger than the first challenge, but both of them are challenges. The first challenge is variants. Um, just to define terms, these are just, each dot represents sort of a sequenced virus, but the virus, if you look in the middle of this slide, where it says China to Europe introduction event, the virus that swept through China was not the virus that left China. The virus that left China was the first variant. It was called the D614G variant. It was more contagious than the original virus, the original virus that was in Wuhan. That's the virus that swept through Europe. That's the virus that swept through the United States. That's the virus to which all vaccines are made. The, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, the Janssen vaccine, the UK AstraZeneca vaccine, the Nova vaccine, the Novavax vaccine are all designed to prevent infections with the D614G variant. But there are other variants um, that, that have uh, are now what are called variants of concern. Um, the one was isolated initially in the United Kingdom called the B117 variant, the other in South Africa called the B1351 variant, another in Brazil uh, called the P1 variant. And, and on the right-hand side, you just see those mutations that are occurring either in the receptor binding domain or the N-terminal domain, which then renders the, the, uh, the polyclonal antibody response that's generated by natural infection or the polyclonal antibody response that's generated by vaccination possibly less efficient. Now, for the the um, oh, just to make this point that that all of these variants are currently at some level in the United States. Okay, so, so I'm going to pro provide some hopeful news here. I do think we have some information about whether or not these variants escape vaccine-induced immunity. So this is a study that was done by Pfizer um, in the United in the United Kingdom. What they found was an, and. Um, as well as in Israel. But by early March, Israel had inoculated 71% of its population with Pfizer's vaccine. The vaccine was 97% effective against disease caused by that UK variant and 94% effective at preventing uh, asymptomatic infection. So the UK variant is fairly common in, in uh, Israel. And this was hopeful. And it makes sense, actually. The, the number of uh, mutations in that UK variant was were, were not that dramatic to scare you about its, its ability to resist. Uh, uh, the uh, the um, immune response that's induced by natural infection or immunization against the D614G variant. Janssen has also tested its vaccine in both South Africa and Brazil. And what they found here is in Brazil, you can see that the protection against severe critical disease was 87%. In, in South Africa, um, the protection against disease was a severe critical disease was, was 87%. 
which is excellent. And, and you know, in Brazil, the, there's about 69% of the strains circulating are actually that variant. And in South Africa, about 95% of the strains that are circulating are that variant. So that's good news. I mean, what you can say about these vaccines then so far is that these vaccines can keep you out of the hospital and keep you from dying. Um, Novavax, which is not a vaccine that is yet approved in this country, but likely will be submitted for pr approval sometime in the next few months, was also tested against these two variants. Uh, the, the Novavax strategy is a purified viral protein approach um, using a baclovirus expression system, very much like the, uh, the vaccine flu block. Um, in UK, this vaccine was 96% effective against the D614G strain of preventing mild, moderate, and severe disease, which is excellent. The vaccine was 86% effective against all disease caused by the UK variant. In South Africa, the vaccine was only 55% effective against all disease caused by the South African variant, but again, was highly effective in pre preventing severe disease, which is really what you want. Um, if you have mild or low moderate disease, while that is uncomfortable and does make it more difficult to get to herd immunity, at least it's keeping people from the hospital and from dying. I think the other challenge to, to this is going to be um, the anti-vaccine group groups. I think that um, that you can divide this into two groups. I, th I think one is what I would call a vaccine skeptic, which is fair. I think you should be skeptical of anything you put into your body, including vaccines. Um, the, the, uh, it looks like the skepticism is, is eroding to some extent. If you look at, at uh, polls that were done back in September, 34% uh, of people said they would definitely get the vaccine. That increased in December as we got more information. And now um, this is a study recently out of the University of Washington. They estimate that about 70 to 75% of people um, have said that they would get this vaccine. So that's good. Um, the, the other group that worries me more is what I would call the vaccine cynic. Um, these are people who are not um, uh, impressed by data. They believe that uh, they're basically conspiracy theorists, which seems to rule in this country. Um, they believe that uh, the pharmaceutical companies are lying to them, the government's lying to them, medical establishment's lying to them, they don't buy it. And, uh, and, and we're, we're only going to learn about how much of a problem this is by the summer when right now we don't have enough vaccine for people that want it. Once we have enough vaccine for everybody, you're gonna see how many people are choosing not to vaccinate. And what you worry about is that it would be a large enough percentage that would preclude us from getting to a herd immunity. And I think we, we need to be, have about 80% of the population immune if we're really gonna significantly slow the spread of this virus. Uh, that's what worries me. And that's going to be the fight over the summer, how we're going to deal with that group. I mean, you're already seeing it. You're already seeing people even who work in long-term care facilities where the mortality rate has been 40% for this virus, who are staff in long-term care facilities who have refused vaccines. There, I, there is not a hospital in this country where there haven't been people who have chosen not to get this vaccine, even though they've been offered it. And these are people who work in, in a medical field. Wait till you see what happens once we hit the summer and, and everybody can get a vaccine. I mean, it's estimated that about 14% percent of uh, people who are Black or African American or said they will definitely not, not get this vaccine. And you probably saw that recent CNN poll where 46 percent of Republicans said that they will definitely not get this vaccine, especially uh, Republican men. It's hard to argue uh, against this. I, as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, you can't use logic and reason to convince someone out of an argument that they didn't use logic and reason to get into. So in any case, um, I'll stop there. Thanks for your attention. Assuming you were paying attention, since I can't see anybody, but I'm assuming you were paying attention and I'll take any questions you have. Great, thank you so, so much, um, Dr. Offit. That was wonderful. Um, and I can tell you people are paying attention because we have a lot of great questions in the chat, which we'll try to work through um, some of these. And for those we don't get to, we can also address them in the meet and greet. Um, so the first question we have, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, considering that in order to achieve world herd immunity, we need to consider all vaccines that are being offered around the world. Um, what do we know about the safety and efficacy of vaccines used in other countries in particular about vaccines like um, Sinovac? Thank you. Well, the, 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 the one you worry about is the UK AstraZeneca vaccine. That's a replication defective um, simian adenovirus that was billed as the world's vaccine. I mean, you're, the premise of your question is exactly right. We are only as strong as the weakest country out there. I mean, we are at risk of, of being infected, of being uh, overwhelmed by this virus to the extent, or being hurt by this virus, to the extent that anyone in the world is still suffering the infection. I mean, if you don't believe that, just look at the polio vaccine. I mean, we, we still give a polio vaccine every year in this country for a virus that has not caused, has, has not been a problem since the 1970s. 
Um, we do it because it's still common in Pakistan, it's still common in Afghanistan, or common enough, and international travel is common. So that's always going to be true. The, the, the UK AstraZeneca vaccine, you know, is, it's, it's cheap, it's easily made, it was going to be the world's vaccine. Um, the initial reports of thromboembolism following the receipt of that vaccine didn't worry me so much because thromboembolism is common. Uh, you know, I'm talking about deep vein thrombosis, subsequent pulmonary embolism. I mean, they're in the, this country, the U.S., between as many as 600,000 more people will have a thromboembolism event a year. It occurs in as much as one in a thousand people in this country. So that there was, were temporal associations between getting that vaccine and having thromboembolism was not surprising. What worries me more is, I don't know if you've seen this, this uh, missive that was sent out yesterday by the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany. What they reported were seven cases of central venous thrombosis, um, which were associated, which occurred in people uh, 20 to 50 years of age. It occurred within four days to 14 days after getting the vaccine, uh, was associated with three deaths in those seven people. Now, central venous thrombosis is not common. I mean, it only occurs in about five per million people per year. These were seven people who within two weeks had that phenomenon. Now, I think, and so as a consequence, more than 10 European countries have stopped giving that vaccine. Now, the UK hasn't stopped. They've continued to give the vaccine and continue to try and reassure. The emergency, I'm not sorry, the European Medicines Agency or EMA is meeting presumably, uh, met yesterday, presumably, and is going to presumably uh, release their findings today. You need an explanation for those cases. Now, maybe there's an underlying medical reason that explains that. Uh, maybe if you put it in a broader context, you can see it's no different in a vaccinated than unvaccinated group, which would surprise me. But we need answers for this because right now we have sufficiently scared people about that vaccine and it's hard to unscare people even where if this were a coincidental but not causal phenomenon but i, I do worry about this uh, this, this the, you know for all the tyranny that comes with you know small numbers of derived from large databases th this is a cluster that does worry me so we need we need answers to this yeah um another question so thank you for this talk um is there any correlation uh, of the symptoms basically after getting a vaccine um, in its protection against COVID um, or severe disease. Um, so it's basically severity of symptoms correlating to level of protection after that vaccine. Right, so, so um, a good question, a frequently asked question. The, the, I, I don't know of studies that have looked at that. I mean, but one can take reassurance of the fact that basically 50% or fewer of people who get the, these vaccines have those kind of side effects. Nonetheless, 95% are protected. So clearly you don't have to have those side effects in order to be protected. I don't know whether that's been correlated with side effects and degree of protection, but you know that 95% of people are protected, say in the, in the case of Moderna and Pfizer, against all manner of illness. So that's good. Um, looks like you touched on the next question a little bit in your talk. Um, so I might go to the next one. If all teens and adults 16 and older um, are offered vaccine and hopefully take it, and the COVID numbers drop uh, us out of this pandemic, would there be reason to immunize younger children, particularly those less than 10 years old? It, it's, I think that's one of those things you're going to see how, how we go. Because I think right now that the studies from 12 to 18 years of age are fully recorded, recruited and, and in process. I think it is likely that by the summer we would have vaccines for the greater than 12 year old. And then we will start to enter the winter. And the winter is what's going to tell all, at least the way I see this. Um, I think that, that, that um, if we don't have an adequate percentage of the population immune by next winter, you're going to see the virus surge again. If we do, then you'll see a bump, but not a surge. Um, and so we'll see. And then the question is, it comes, you know, if, if we don't see it, if we have a dramatic reduction in cases and hospitalizations and deaths, we may feel less compelled to vaccinate children. But, but I do think, you know, children do grow up. And um, if this vaccine is durable in terms of its immunity, um, the virus certainly is not going to go away from the world for a long time. Um, I, I hope I'm right about this sort of the weather vaccine thing, and we do see it continue with dropping cases. There's certainly a number of smart people on television who've said, you know, given B117 contagiousness, that we're going to see a surge in cases in the spring. A number of people have said that. So um, I could be wrong there, but I uh, we'll see. 
we will see. Of course, you know, I just like to say just uh, that when I, when this vaccine first started killing people in March, I was asked to be on CNN International with Christian Amanpour, where I predicted that there would be fewer than 60,000 deaths from this virus because I couldn't imagine it would be worse than flu the previous year. And the reason I said that was that, you know, look at South Korea, look at Japan, look at China, look at, look at their populations, percentage of the population, and then extrapolate it to us. We should have fewer than 60,000 deaths, not realizing that, that we would ultimately have uh, 20% 20, 20 of the world's deaths and only 4% of the population. We were bad at this. So, uh, so it's just a tip to people who are future in the future interested in communicating science to the public. If you're gonna be wrong, go on national television and be wrong. Don't, don't just tell your friends something stupid. You know, make an idiot of yourself in front of you know, millions of people. Yeah, good advice, I like it. Um, uh, another interesting question. So does administration of acetaminophen or ibuprofen either before or after COVID vaccine reduce efficacy? So we know that from studies in, in the Czech Republic and Australia, that if you pre-administer antipyretics before a vaccine, and one of the studies, I think it was Australia, that was flu vaccine, the Czech Republic was a variety of pediatric vaccines, you can reduce the immune response. Not shocking. I mean, when we make fever, we make fever because um, it, 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 it enhances our immune response. I mean, our immune response works better at a higher temperature. That's why we're willing to suffer the metabolic cost that comes with fever. Now, those studies weren't done post-inoculation. They were all done as pre-treatment. So, so I don't know. But I would say that, that it's not a leap to believe that would be possible. So if you can gut it out and just take my advice, which is the constant whining advice, um, then, you don't, then you don't have to take antipyretics. So by that constant whining, that all went away. Great. Um, and then a question, this is actually going back a little bit to the, the weather um, point. Um, so thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, what are your thoughts on the surge recently in tropical countries, some of which are doing very well with immunizing their people and sort of how that ties into that weather conversation? Yeah, I think we make a mistake when we try and compare events in tropical countries with events in temperate climates. I mean, in the United States, for example, influenza is a winter disease. In, in Brazil, it's year round. In the United States, rotavirus is a winter disease. In Brazil, it's year round. And so, so there are differences. I'm not sure why those things are true, but it, it is true. So I, I think it's hard to extrapolate those, those two things. Yes, it's true in Brazil, it's hot and humid. Nonetheless, the virus is transmitted, but you'd think it's an infectious disease specialist. I would have any idea of, what, of the seasonality of these viruses. I don't. I mean, polio is a summer gastroenteritis. Rotavirus is a winter gastroenteritis. Um, they're both, you know, non-enveloped RNA viruses. I, I don't know why there's differences in those things. I don't, I'm sure maybe somebody knows I don't. And so, but don't, I don't think you can extrapolate temperate climates to, from tropical climates. Yeah, that's great, great point. Um, and so the next few questions actually tie in a little bit together. Um, so related to the mRNA, mRNA vaccine trial data for 12 to 18 year olds, sort of what is the timeline for that um, possibly being submitted? And then when do we think vaccines will be available for children in pediatric offices? Right, so, so again, so those, those trials, 12 to 18 are fully recruited. Um, I think assuming we have, uh, things are going the way they're going, I think it is perfectly possible that vaccine for the greater than 12 year old will be available over the summer. I think in terms of the, the younger child, um, it's possible it could be available by the, because now they'll go from 12 to 18 to, then they'll go to the six to 12 year old initially. I think that'll be the bigger thing. Um, I think that's possible you could have it by the end of this year, more likely the beginning of next year. But again, it depends how, how this pandemic plays out. Great. Um, and then a question from John Williams. So fantastic talk as always, Paul. What about T cell immunity against variants? Yeah, so that, that's one of the, the, the things that's a little hopeful here. I mean, the T helper cell responses are more broadly reactive, obviously, than the, the antibody responses. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful. I think here's what I would say. A line hasn't been crossed yet in terms of, of, of the need for a second generation vaccine, meaning the need to include variants in a second generation vaccine. The line gets crossed when people who either were naturally infected or were fully immunized, nonetheless, when they're exposed to a variant are hospitalized or in the ICU or dead. When that happens, and we know now that the vaccine has, uh, or, or natural infection does not protect against severe critical disease, then you're talking about a second generation vaccine, which people often refer to as a booster response. It's not a booster response, it's a second vaccine. Um, we haven't crossed that line yet. Um, we might, but we haven't. Great, and then I think we'll take one more question before moving. Um, to the next session. So from Dr. Dermody, wonderful talk, Paul, thanks much. Uh, would you comment on whether the vaccines prevent transmission? 
Right, so there, there was one study done um, with the Pfizer vaccine suggesting that there was a, a clear decrease in asymptomatic infection. So that was good. I mean, again, makes it easier to, to get on top of this virus in terms of providing herd immunity. So, so that, was, that was a hopeful sign and surprising, actually. I wouldn't have imagined that this vaccine would provide what we refer to um, as sterilizing immunity. I mean, the measles vaccine does that, but a lot of vaccines don't do that. The rotavirus vaccine doesn't do that. The flu vaccine doesn't do that. The pertussis vaccine doesn't do that. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccine doesn't do that. So it was a, a pleasant surprise. I think, I think the answer is, is that, that while it might not be complete, that those who are vaccinated will probably shed less virus than those who aren't vaccinated asymptomatically. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Offit. This was incredible, um, just super engaging. Um, and we're really grateful for the gift of your time. So we'll ask folks to transition over um, to the meet and greet portion. Um, the link should be posted in the chat. Uh, but thanks again, Dr. Offit. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Good luck.